Good. Let's pray. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we come to you this morning. Gratitude is filling our hearts because of all that you have done for us and all that you are doing right now. And God, we are praying that you would illuminate our hearts and minds through your word. God, as we walk our way through a passage of Scripture today, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will help us to see and to be gripped by your words, and that those words will come to life in us and the way we conduct ourselves and the way we relate to you and to one another. May the Lord be magnified in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Storms continue to batter island nations around the world and the southern coast of the United States at the same time. And while the storms are flooding, drought continues to threaten many nations' drinking water supplies and crop productions. Global economic inflation is rampant, makes life harder for the lower classes, and homelessness is increasing. Grassroots Feminist protests in Iran continue to grow in spite of some violent crackdowns against them. Russia continues to threaten and pummel Ukraine cities. The government of Myanmar continues to oppress its citizens, prompting massive emigration. Ethiopia has suffered a brutal civil war for the last two years, yet they, may, they are on the verge now of reaching a peace accord. Meanwhile, Peruvian citizens clash with police in anti-government protests. Leadership changes in Britain, in China, in Brazil, in Israel have further shaken the precarious balance of powers in the world. And our own U.S. midterm elections are before us this week. Now, I know that sounds kind of like a news bulletin report, but I just wanted to sort of frame what I have to say with what's actually going on around us today. Because I wouldn't want you to imagine that the good news of Jesus Christ is somehow about escaping what's happening around us in the world. That it's somehow going to seal us in a little cave, in a little cocoon of our own. I don't want you to think that this is a cocoon. Windows are open. You can see through the glass. We can hear the sounds outside. And that's purposeful in design, because I believe that our worship to Jesus Christ needs to be integrally connected to the life we live in the world every day. So issues both natural and man-made, real and imagined, deepen the divide among Americans Civility in the public square has largely been lost, and vitriolic voices vie for the center stage. This is just a 30,000-foot glimpse of the world you and I live in today. Is it any wonder that people are desperate to find peace? Some believe they can find it by abandoning their own families or their near neighbors, some believe they can find it by relocating to what they hope will be a more tranquil community. Some can only hope to find it through overstimulation with every pleasure that they can get their hands on. Some can only find it by dulling their senses with alcohol or drugs. And some can only hope to find it by ending the noise and conflict once and for all by their own hasty exit. Yet, you and I sit here today in this room and on Zoom in the midst of the church of Jesus Christ in a service of worship because Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled nor let it be fearful. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you'll have trouble and suffering, but take courage. I have conquered the world. That's why we find ourselves here, here in a house of worship today. And I want to explore with you that beautiful yet precious gift 
that our Savior has provided. So will you open your Bible with me to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter number 5. And let me read aloud the first two verses of that chapter. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. I love that. Now let's take a slow and thoughtful walk through these two verses to see what we can extract from them that will help us in our present life. Perhaps we can find that peace and faith and hope and joy that he wrote about. Is that okay? That would be all right, huh? All right, let's take it word by word, if you will. Therefore, This word ties the first four chapters with the present text before us now, as a cause is tied to its effect, or as the foundation of a house is tied to its superstructure. Therefore means because of everything I've just told you. And so the first four chapters are not unimportant, because if we want to have peace with God— We need to take in what's in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. I'm not going to review those for you in case you were worried about that. But a brief summary of those chapters would simply be this. The natural world reveals the existence of God as creator. Therefore, people everywhere are without excuse for ignoring him. The Gentiles, or non-Jewish people, who had no further revelation of God than the created world, are still sinful and have earned God's wrath. And the Jews, who also were given the law and the prophets, themselves are still sinful and have earned God's wrath. Circumcision as a ritual and obeying the law in fits and starts are not enough to appease God's wrath. So all people, Jews and Gentiles, are powerless against sin. No one is righteous before God based on their own merit. We all try, but we all fail. And so if you're going to keep score, F is the score. Yet God has granted us forgiveness. Justification is the word Paul uses here as a free gift, and we can only receive that through trusting the good heart of the giver who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to bear our sin and shame and receive the judgment in our place. That's what Paul has been writing about in the first four chapters, and now we're greeted with, therefore. Here it all comes to a climax. It all comes to a crescendo, and he begins to unfold the results of all of that for our life. Therefore, he said, having been justified, and this is plainly in the past tense, isn't it? Something that's already been accomplished. To emphasize that Jesus stood in our place, he died in our place, and he rose from the dead in our place, and we were then justified by God. It's a done deal. What is justified? Somebody said, Justified means I'm just as if I'd never sinned. That clean, that welcome in the house of God. So Jesus was not the down payment for our justification. He was the entire cost. He paid in full from the outset. It's like buying a new car with cash. No payments after that. So our justification is also complete, finished accomplished, with no interest due and no payments yet to be made. It's a done deal. Say the word done. Here are the keys. Drive it off the lot. It's yours. Amen. Therefore, having been justified by faith, our justification cost Jesus everything. He paid for it with his life. In fact, he paid for it 
all his life long. Your only part in the arrangement is to have faith, to trust him, and to trust what God has done through him, to trust the one who sent him, and to trust the one who paid our debt, to trust that he meant this for us, and to trust that he will make good on his promise. Not only for the sake of his word, and not only for the sake of his own reputation, not only for the sake of the glory of his name, but also for the sake of his son, who paid so high a price. Faith, not only as a mental agreement to the matter, nor only as a momentary flash of awareness, but faith as your reciprocal promise to the trustworthiness of God himself. Faith as the ongoing character of your relationship with God. Faith in everyday living. Faithfulness in mind, heart, and strength. Spirit, soul, and body. Faith in a continuing walk, in a continuing relationship with God, with his people, with his creation. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We've gone from past tense to present tense. This is not we have peace, as in calmness of mind, or calmness of heart, or an experience of restfulness. He said we have peace with God, as in the complete cessation of all hostilities. Not a temporary truce, but the end of the war. The war is over. God is not against us. He's for us. Peace with God. And not just an end to the resistance and the fighting, but a new union, a new nation, a new kingdom, a new charter, a new constitution, a new people, and a new vision. Peace with God because we who have trusted have come over to his side. We have said your way is right, and we will follow you. Paul also wrote to the church in Colossae, God rescued us from the domain of darkness, and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He's made a transfer. We've made a transit. We have moved from the old life to the new. We've moved from darkness to light. We've moved from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Passed from death to life. And right here, we can see why every effort to find peace for ourselves while ignoring the life-controlling tension between us and our Creator will be frustratingly fruitless. All the efforts to fix this, patch this, build a bridge, make ourselves a solid place to stand apart from God and apart from His Christ cannot bear fruit. If you should see steam or smoke pouring from under the hood of your car, the solution is not to turn on the windshield wipers, and it's not to turn up the volume of the music. Don't ignore it. Pull over, stop, and take care of the problem. You've got a problem, right? And so it is in everyday life. When you feel the weight of guilt or of shame, or fear pressing on your mind. Don't self-medicate. Don't sublimate. Don't ignore it. Deal with it. These are the warning lights on the dashboard of your heart. They're put there by God to alert us to our needs. And if you take it to God, instead of trying to hide it from Him, He'll help you. He will help you. And how does he do that? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And the next slide. <laughs> and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when he said that, he meant that. He said no one, and that means not even one. Nobody. He is the way, so no other path will bring you to the Father. He is the truth, and anything else is either imagination or hallucination. He is the life, and apart from Him, we're only dying day by day. So I ask you, do you know Jesus today? Do you know Jesus today? We have peace with God through Him. He is our peacemaker, and He is our peace. And we are those who believe in God, as Paul wrote, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised up because of our justification. Jesus canceled our sins. He erased our guilt and our shame. He justified our lives. He drove out fear with his love. To Christ be all the glory. To him alone, give your praise. Who should make such a sacrifice for his enemies? Such love. Such wondrous love. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also, dot, dot, dot. But wait, there's more. (laughs) There's more? Yes, there is. There's so much more. And if you have thought your, your salvation only meant, I'm forgiven, I'm set free, you are missing out on the most that there is, because that's just the doorway. On Tuesdays, we've been studying some of the parables that Jesus told the crowds who came to hear him speak. And one of the best known is the story of a farmer who sowed seed on four different kinds of soil with four different results. The farmer was the same, the seed was the same, but the results were different. And it was the soil that made the difference. One area was littered with thorny weeds. And when the good seed sprang up, the weeds just overwhelmed it and choked it so that it produced no fruit. It was growing, but it wasn't bearing any fruit. It couldn't reach maturity. And Jesus explained that he was talking about people whose thoughts and lives were choked with worries about life circumstances and illusions that wealth was the answer that could protect them. What you have to deal with and what you think you lack in life cannot determine the fruitfulness or the effectiveness of your life as you put your trust in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you how putting your trust in Him from day to day transforms the outcome of your life, and it is not dependent on the things that you possess. It is not dependent on the things that you want to have or think you need. When you have Jesus, you don't need anything else. He'll give you all kinds of things that we need from day to day, but you don't need another source but Him. So just look at what else Jesus has accomplished for us. Let's take the dots off of that, and through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith. Introduction to whom? Jesus has introduced us to the King of the universe, the God who created everything that is, not only the worlds that we see, but also the ones we don't. To the one who made all things, he has brought us and introduced us. This is my friend. This is my follower. This is my disciple. To the one who made all things and who understands all things and whose throne is always accessible to you, 
Jesus has brought us through faith. Your faith has unlocked that door. Your faith has made a way for that introduction. And Jesus Christ has made you known by name that the God of the universe, the King of all kings. The writer to the Hebrews said, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus has also introduced us to the King as our Father. He said, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. He who has seen me has seen the Father. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. You know what he's like. You know what he wants. You know what he's willing to give to make you his. He's not a distant or remote celestial being. He's an ever-present helper. He's a good dad. Jesus has introduced us also to an enduring relationship with God, who has said, I will never leave you, and I will never abandon you. We've obtained this introduction by faith. We've obtained this introduction because we trusted in Jesus Christ, and we trusted God's way of making us right with him through Jesus. We started with faith, and we continue in the same way, trusting the Lord, what he said and what he's done, what he's saying and what he's doing. Each day, we can approach him in the same way, by faith, and find him true and faithful to his words. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Wow. This amazing relationship that we have today with the King of the universe, our Heavenly Father, is a solid relationship. You need to let that settle in your heart. It's a solid relationship. We can all think of relationships that we have had that were not solid. Some of them very fleeting, some of them fake, and others were good for a while, but then something got in the way and they fell apart. But this relationship with God through Jesus Christ is rock solid. And that's coming from his end to you. It's rock solid, it's dependable, it's open, it's caring. He called it, and we call it also, a relationship of grace. We can come to the throne of grace. We can find mercy there, we can find help in our time of need. It's grace. Paul said to the Ephesians, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not as a result of work so that no one may boast. It was begun in grace. It's covered in grace. It's sustained by grace. Grace through faith. Your part and mine is to trust him. His part is to make good on the promise of grace. And you can count on this. Whenever we approach the Lord by faith, in prayer, in praise, or just in crying out in a moment of need, He hears us, and you'll be received by Him with grace. That doesn't change. It doesn't change. Whether you feel confident or not so confident today, whether you feel like you've been good 
or you feel like you've made a mess of things. It doesn't change because God doesn't change. We do. I do. Don't you? Oh, yeah, we change. We're all over the map. But God wrote the map. He knows where we are, and he's always re ready and available to receive us. Thanks to God. We can stand on that. It's a solid relationship, this relationship of grace. I wonder sometimes if we think, you know, well, grace is like, it's not what we deserve. So how solid can that be? But see, that's the whole point. It's not what we deserve. It's not even connected to what we deserve. It's not even connected to what you're trying to do, to be good and to be obedient and to be strong and to do the right thing. All of that is good. And you should, because the Spirit of God is in you, and the Word of God is in you, and you ought to live it out the best you can. But however you have failed at that, whenever you have failed at that, has not changed grace. Because grace covers all of those potholes, all those ups and downs. So he said, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we've obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope. How many of you have used the word exult in the last week? Month? Year? Yeah. It's hard for us to pull that one out. Exult. Anyone know what it means? Lift up, raise up. I think you're thinking about exalt. And exalt and exalt, though related, are not the same. What is it to exalt? It's to overflow with joy. That's what it means. Happy! That's what it means. Exalt is an expression of ebullient joy, the kind of joy that results from knowing that all your sins have been completely, finally, and forever forgiven, the kind of joy that results from knowing that shame has been lifted off your shoulders and replaced with a robe of righteousness. The kind of joy that comes when your fear has been driven out by God's complete love. It is, as the Apostle Peter said, an indescribable joy and full of glory. And in this case, it's also full of hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in him, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is our greatest joy. We exult in hope. Jesus makes all of our tomorrows look better than they ever did before. You may have plenty or you may have little. But with Jesus, your tomorrows will be better than without him. Guaranteed. This is our overflowing joy. We have hope. Listen, we use the word hope like uh, wishful thinking. You know, well, I hope this will happen, or I hope I'll, I'll strike it rich, or I hope I'll meet my soulmate, or things like that. We, we hope. And it's really just wishful thinking. It's, it's our preferred future. But the hope we're talking about here is not what you would like or what you wish you had. The hope we're talking about here is everything that God has provided and promised in the Lord Jesus Christ concerning not only this life, 
but the life that is to come. Because just as surely as Jesus died and rose again, you will die and you will rise again. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. This life is not the end. It's not about how much can you amass here and now, whether of pleasure or of things. This life is not the end. It's just the threshold into the next. This life is so that you might find him who's searching for you because he loves you. And if you find him, you found the pearl of great price. You found everything you need. You might as well sell all that you have to buy him because you won't need anything else as a source and provision for all of your days here and all of your days to come. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. Now, you and I can bring glory to God outwardly by the things we say and the things we do, especially the things we do to and for other people. Paul said, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything should aim at what will bring him glory, what will magnify his name, what will make his heart glad, what will enhance my relationship with him. But we also bring glory to God by the things we think and say within ourselves, just when you're alone, when you're by yourself. And when we live like this, it eventually shows up on the outside. When we bring glory to God by our thoughts, by our reasoning, when we bring glory to God by the things we whisper to ourselves when we're alone in the car or alone on our bed, when we bring glory to God here, He's magnified elsewhere also. It overflows. It affects our relationships with other people. It affects how we treat other people. So, you know, it's very different than just carrying a little rule book with you and saying, now, when I get together with my friends today, oh yeah, I have to, yes, okay, and uh-huh, got it. It's more than taking a little rule book with you, a guidebook, to show you how to be a good neighbor or a good friend. It's it's about all that time before you even left the house, before you got in the car, before you walked out the door. What were you thinking? What were you saying to yourself? What songs were you singing? What were you reading? What were you watching on TV? All of those things that are pouring into your heart are either drawing you closer to God or sending you in another direction. I don't mean you just have to read the Bible and nothing else. But I mean, whatever else you're reading or whatever else you're watching, Christ is with you. He's sitting right on the couch next to you. Does he like watching it? Does he like listening to it? Is this really edifying your life? Or is this some kind of escape for you? We can build up our relationship with him. And when we do it automatically flows out when we encounter other people. Even when people get in your face and mistreat you, what you've been putting in is what comes out. You know, it's like a sponge. Whatever you fill it with, squeeze it a little and what comes out? Whatever you filled it with. And your heart and your mind are like that. It's a sponge. And you're filling it with something every day. And then you find yourself suddenly in a difficult situation and you're feeling pressure and what comes out. Read a lot of what comes out on Facebook. It's not pretty. It's not pretty. I'll leave it there. 
So we bring glory to God also by the things that we think and say within ourselves. Peter said, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Because that's what we're talking about, exulting in hope of the glory of God. Not just hope for me, not just hope for our little congregation, but hope for God's glory. Because don't you know, God's plan goes on beyond mine, beyond yours, beyond ours. The glory for which we hope through Jesus Christ is more than God's own glory. It's also the glory that you and I and all of his people will share with Christ our King because he's chosen to share his glory with us. It's not just about making God look good. It's about acknowledging that God is good. And in so doing, preparing, molding, shaping, and filling our heart to be with the good God forever and forever. Jesus responded to his disciples. He said, didn't I tell you? If you believe, you would see the glory of God. We read some people's glimpses of the glory in the Scriptures, but that's not what he's talking about. I don't know if you've read some of those passages by Isaiah or John the Revelator and and thought sometimes, oh, sounds amazing. I wish I could see that. Well, keep that alive, because that's your destiny. You will see the glory of God, the glory of God, and it will eclipse everything else you've ever thought was glorious in this world. My breath is taken away by a sunset, or a sunrise, or a waterfall, or birds on the water or in flight. My breath gets taken away by all kinds of things that God has made, but those are just things God has made. Do they glorify Him? Yes, to some extent, yes. Because what I see in that beauty is His handiwork. But that's just His handiwork. It's like reading my signature and saying, That's a beautiful signature. I wish I knew the guy who wrote that. We look at these things and we're in awe, and we should be. But I'm trying to magnify for you the experience of seeing the glory of God himself. Not the reflection of his glory in the things he has made, but the glory of God himself. That's what Christ has for us. We're going to see that. We're going to see that in our lives. We're going to see that in our relationships. We're going to see that in our world. You and I are being called and drawn and built and prepared to see the glory of God. Didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. The resurrection of Jesus is not only the stamp of God's approval on his his fulfillment of the plan for salvation, it's also the example of what God has in mind and in store for you and I. Jesus, the first fruits, and then all the rest of us. You and I will be resurrected as he was resurrected. You and I will come to this kind of a glorious life because that's what God has in mind for us. That's what Jesus is to us. This life of faith will bring us to a resurrected life of our own, which we'll share forever with our resurrected Lord. Look what the Lord 
has done. I close with this final passage. Whoops, that was not the final passage. Or was it? I'm going to read it to you. I don't see it up there. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And that is based on this. Didn't I tell you? Won't you believe? And we will see the glory of God. Amen.